about Jesus. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will come help us to hear your heart and receive all that you want to say to us. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Do you know if you've gained Christ? Did that sound like a question? I hope it did. Do you know that you've gained Christ? Yes. Do you know that if you hunger after him, you will have a desire to win his heart? Yes. Yes. Oh, I pray you do. This passage of scripture, the Apostle Paul renounces everything in his past and and Leading up to these verses, Paul talks about the things that he could boast about. And he says, but all of that doesn't matter. Paul had a lot of things that he could boast about. We won't go into the list. You can read it and see it. He had a lot of things he could boast about. But he chose to treat it all as loss in exchange for knowing and having Jesus. Oh, you guys, and, and may, may our hearts ring and sing with that same desire, that same longing, that everything else in this world is garbage compared to knowing and loving Jesus, our Master. In fact, the, the other thing about the Apostle Paul is that he was so committed to serving Jesus and not being distracted by anyone or anything that he chose not to marry. And he even encouraged others to do the same. And you know what? All of us have to come to that place. You know, the Bible says, uh, in, are you going to burn? Or, or are you going to uh, marry? And if, if, you're, if you're burning, then you probably should marry. And, and we won't go into the full anatomy of what that means, okay? Maybe. But I think you got the message, right? Uh, I had that conversation with the Lord many years ago. As before I met my beloved bride, now of 45 years. Wow. Lord, I'll, 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 I'll be celibate. Lord, I'll be, the, I'll be the single minister. And then a few days later, he brought Doc back into my life and said, go get him, son. I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but all of, us, all of us have to make those kinds of commitments in our lives, where we say, Jesus, you're going to be number one. You're going to be the all-consuming fire of my life, and no one and nothing else is going to take your place. In fact, let's look at it from the first point in your outline, from the, the perspective of the commitment of the bride of Christ. Friends, the bride of Christ will be a holy people who long to be pleasing to their Lord who lives so obediently and so separated from all other things that the heart of our Lord Jesus is ravished because of our love for him and because of our not just thinking about it, but the doing of laying everything else aside and considering everything else rubbish in comparison to our relationship with him that we are so focused on pleasing our Lord that nothing else matters. And the church, friends, must turn so completely from the world and from the idols 
and may Jesus be one thing that we give our attention to. In fact, friends, let's say it in marital terms. Our relationship with Jesus is till death do us part. And then at death, we are going to be re reunited with our group. Hallelujah. <laughs> There's a reason why the, the great dinner in heaven is called the marriage feast of the Lamb. When, when the Lamb gets his bride. Hallelujah. When the groom, his majesty, the Lord Jesus, it's his bride. Amen. So the second thing I want you to see uh, in your outline from the word of God is don't be distant or casual with Jesus. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've ever been distant or casual with Jesus. Because all of us have done it. Amen. Amen. There are, there are believers that are okay with being distant and casual. But that is not the Lord's will for us. He wants us to have that intimate, personal relationship. He doesn't want us to have a relationship of convenience. Lord, when it's convenient, I'll go to church. And Lord, when it's convenient, I'll, I'll go and encourage my brothers and sisters. Lord, when it's convenient, I'll bring my time, talent, and treasure. Friends, the Lord doesn't want us to have a, a convenient relationship. We don't want to just fit Jesus into our lives. We want to fit into his life. Amen. Friends, and if we'll seek the Lord with all of our hearts, we'll eat the heavenly bread. And the heavenly bread is better than anything you've ever known, and it's better for you than anything you've ever known. Amen. And once you've tasted the heavenly bread, nothing else will be able to satisfy. The Lord calls us to move away from all other things and not be distant or casual with him. The Holy Spirit is drawing us to the heart of God. And he invites us to come into the heart of God and into the fullness of Jesus. He invites us to come away from the hype and the compromise and the half-heartedness and the emptiness. He invites us to come away from a gospel of ease, friends. And to, he invites us to turn away from everything and make Christ our everything. Amen. How many of you know that there's a price to going deeper to have Jesus. The third thing that I want you to see in your notes and in your outline this morning, there's a price. And we're gonna just unpack that a little bit. The, the price requires more than, than words. <laughs> it's, it, the price is more than emotions, more than promises. Mm -hmm. Amen. We have to be ready to lay it all down to follow Jesus. There is suffering and self-denial and, and, and a cross to be carried involved in going deeper in Jesus and everything that pulls at you from the world and from the flesh must be cut off. Amen. Mm -hmm. Must be. We cannot have the Lord's fullness, friends, if we are still pulled by the world. Amen. If we can't have an I'll do it my way attitude in our relationship and walk with the Lord, our attitude must be always, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Amen. Not my will, but your will be done. I've known people. You've known people, possibly, that have wept bitter tears. That, that have wanted, that have, that have at one time known the glory and the, and the wonder of that deep, intimate relationship with the Lord, but they allowed other things to come in and steal away that precious relationship with Jesus. And they wake up some morning and, and realize that they have walked uh, now in the ways of the world rather than in the ways of the world. Had a, had a, can we talk just for a minute? Uh, over these years, there have been a, there have been some pastors and others, Christian leaders that the Lord has sent me out after. 
and, and I believe he wants you to go out after him too. Amen. I had one of those conversations early a couple weeks ago with a brilliant young man that loved Jesus with all his heart. He and his wife were preparing to go to the mission field. And through a series of circumstances and, and choices, they wandered away from the Lord. And this man called me weeping, what do I do? And, and I said to him what the word of God says. And that's, that's what we have to say. And that's what we hold to. Amen. Amen. The word of God says you lay down your life for her and those kids. You don't want to have to someday tell them why you did not lay down your life for their mother. You lay it all down. It is a dying. you got to kill this ugly thing in you that keeps you from being the man of God. The Lord wants it. Don't, 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 don't just hide it somewhere. You got to kill that thing. Boy, those are those are difficult conversations sometimes. But but there are there are those who are dragged off by the enemy, as it were. Yeah, they are they are they are pulled away from God by. The work of the enemy, friends, and it's so important that that we go out after them, and and that that we understand that there are some principles like old friends and old habits have to be let go of, right? Go ahead and say amen. And you know what's going to happen is the Lord's going to give you a whole lot of new friends and a whole lot of good habits. Praise the Lord, <laughs> or better better habits anyway. Amen. And it comes a time when you and I have to draw lines in the sand and turn away from everything in the past, walk in the direction of Jesus in every way. I want to take you to a very important Old Testament passage. How many of you are familiar with the book of Ruth and her wonderful story? In, in Ruth, the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, I want you to I want you to read this wonderful passage. It says, but Ruth said, and, and she's talking to Naomi. Let me, let me set it up really quick. Uh, Ruth, Ruth is a Moabites. How many of you know what, a, what that is? Okay, you don't have to, you don't have to read uh, She was a Moabite. <laughs> she lived in Moab, uh, which was a God-forsaken uh, home of the devil kind of a place, and Israel was having a, a, a famine. Israel was having a horrible drought. And so Naomi goes with her sons to Moab in order to get food and to recover. And while there, her sons marry Moabites, women who are Moabites. And then the sons die, and, and the famine ends in Israel, and and Naomi is ready to go back to Israel now, and, and her two daughters-in-law, Esther and Orpah, if I'm remembering it. I got it? Are we good so far? Praise the Lord. Ruth, Ruth, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Let's just throw them all in here. <laughs> Pastor John, if you're going to mess it up, just throw it all. Throw them all in there. Okay, so, so Naomi's getting ready to go back to Israel. And, and she has this conversation with the two widows now of her sons. Saying, ladies, I'm going. And Orpah chooses not to go. But Ruth says, entreat me not to leave you. Or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you from me. 
Friends, this is the cry of someone who has made a desperate commitment and wants God more than anything. That's the kind of commitment the Lord is calling you and I to if we will go deeper with him. And just like Ruth, we have to make the choice to go and grow with God. And when you do, you'll be moving right into the heart of Jesus. So that's an Old Testament part of the price of going deeper. You have to cut ties. And she had to leave her family, leave her country, leave her people, and go to where Naomi was going back to her people. And then Naomi's people would be her people. The Apostle Paul gives us another take on the price of going deeper with Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 9, and I'm just going to give you some snippets. It says, we have been made the spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. We both hunger and thirst. We are poorly clothed and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, persecuted, defamed. We have been made as the filth of the world. A little different perspective, isn't it? And that is some of the price that we feel and experience from time to time of going deeper with Jesus. And the Lord calls us. In fact, uh, a few verses later in that same passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore I urge you to imitate me. Friends, you'll be in great company. You'll be in, a, in the company of some wonderful people of God if you will go deeper in the Lord. You'll experience some challenges and some difficulties, but the Lord has great things that he will give to you. Paul, Paul here is not saying, I need you to just go ahead and feel sorry for me. No. He's saying, don't feel sorry for me. I've gained Christ. I, I, there's no reason for you to feel sorry for me. I'm happy to get to experience these difficulties and these beatings and, and these mistreatments, these persecutions, because I have Jesus. And I'm looking forward to the day that I get to go be with him for eternity. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. There's a price to be paid, but there is reward. We just point out four in your outline. There are many rewards for following Jesus. So Ruth goes on into the Holy Land with Naomi. She was led by the Holy Spirit to, the, to, the, to do some gleaning in the field. In other words, to collecting after the reapers have gone by. You collect what is dropped by them. That was allowed. That was one of the things that you know, kind of a social security system that Israel had for those that didn't have food and didn't have jobs, didn't have uh, income. They were allowed to legally go into those fields after the harvesters had gone through and they were uh, allowed to collect up. And so that's what Ruth is doing. And she's led field Boaz, field owned by Boaz. And his people are there, you guys. And, and uh, and God begins to pour out his favor on Ruth as she first makes the choice to follow God, to, to follow in the things of God. And she begins to experience the blessing and the favor. We're not going to go, another day we'll go deeper into the story of Ruth. But in Ruth chapter 2, verse 12, Boaz says this to Ruth. He says, the Lord repay your work and a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Friends, there is a price to be paid. There are difficult choices. There are things to let go of and, and people to say no thank you to. But there's great, incredible reward for those who make Jesus their all in all. And Ruth is a wonderful Old Testament example of that. The fifth thing that I want you to see with me today is that in this whole process of, of wanting to have Jesus more than anything else, 
we become the apple of Christ's eye. As I, as I look out over this wonderful body of Christ, I know that most of you know what that means. When you move into that place of healing, the favor of heaven. Just, just a real quick uh, missionary story of many years ago. How many of you are familiar with Eric, the missionary Eric Little? How many of you are familiar with the movie Chariots of Fire? That's the story of missionary Eric Little. One of my favorite lines from him in, you know, he's an Olympic runner and, and gold medal Olympic runner that then goes to China as a missionary. Oh, you guys. So he's asked, why do you run? He says, Be because when I run, I feel the smile of heaven. And as he's serving the Lord, and as he's walking with Jesus, he, he felt the smile of heaven. And friends, you and I, as we walk with Jesus, and as we serve him, and as we make him a pearl of great price in our lives, as we make him the, the hidden treasure, as we make him the, the, the most important thing in our lives, friends, we are going to be we are going to experience his favor and blessing, and we're going to feel what it feels like to be the apple of his eye. We'll lose the pull of the world, and we'll win the heart of Jesus. And when we win his heart, we win his favor. And we'll never again hunger and thirst in our inner being. He will, out of our innermost being, will flow rivers of living water, ladies and gentlemen. I want to go back to the story of Ruth and Boaz. Boaz later, toward the end of the story, Boaz says to Ruth, I will do for you all that you have desired. Amen. It's kind of like trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. It's kind of like seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6 33, and all these things will be added unto you. You will not be able to hold back the blessing. Boaz says, I will do for you all that you have desired because I can trust in you. Your love is true. You won't leave me for others, no matter how attractive they are. You will be mine only, and I will be yours only. And then, as, as the practice was in those days, at the gates of Bethlehem. Now, does that sound a little familiar? Before ten witnesses, Boaz redeems Ruth and her inheritance. He satisfies all the claims to her and her possessions and acquires her as his wife. They live happily ever after. It's the story of the mighty man of wealth who marries the lowly servant. Does that sound familiar? Our kinsman redeemer, his majesty, the Lord Jesus, the mighty Glorious king of the universe comes and marries the lowly servant. In other words, you and me. What a wonderful story. This afternoon, you know, uh, when you're having your devotions after the potluck or the meeting, after your Sunday afternoon nap, pull out the book of Ruth. <laughs> Read it and enjoy it. It is awesome. It's really a story of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Jesus cleared all the claims the devil had on us and our inheritance, and we are now completely free to become the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. But there's more. Just one more little interesting and an important piece of information. Later on, Ruth gives birth to a son whose name is Obed. 
You know who Obed is? Obed is the great grandfather of King David. In other words, the lineage of Jesus. Did Ruth gain Christ? Oh, yeah. And then some. Jesus became, even in the pre incarnate, her everything. And if we love Jesus unreservedly, if we hunger after him and seek after him, if we will remember him in every choice, if we will ask ourselves, will this please my Lord? I think we'll have the experience where the Lord will say to the angels, oh, look at those guys. They love me so much, they've, they've left everything to follow me. Friends, if you and I will truly hunger after Jesus, we'll win his heart. We'll know his heart and we'll abandon ourselves completely to him. Amen. And we'll rest under his mighty care. May you and I say with not just our lips, but with our heart and soul and our life, I must have.